just a lot of people with kind of athletic backgrounds uh, that that really serves them well, like that kind of commitment, discipline, ambition, you know, rolls into the character of what you're doing. Have you seen a specific way that that's kind of influenced your journey as well? All you're really trying to do is incrementally improve. And I think a lot of people um, would want the massive jumps. You know, you almost want the lottery ticket hockey stick growth from day one. Whereas if you have that probably more fitness or athletic focused background, you understand everything is just about, you know, making small gains 1% every day and the compound interest of that over time will lead to big growth down the road. Hello and welcome to Food and Beverage Therapy Podcast, where we talk about leadership, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the coffee world. Learn from experts, CEOs, and leaders in the coffee industry on how they challenge themselves, continue to grow, innovate, and reinvent the landscape that makes up the business I love, coffee. I'm Jake Leonti, your host. I'm a coffee consultant, business expert, and entrepreneur that has worked at every link of the value chain over a 20 plus year career. I share insights, tips, and mantras to help you along your coffee journey. Hello and welcome to Food and Beverage Therapy Podcast. Today, we are speaking with Jordan Karcher, CEO and founder of Grounds and Hounds, founded in 2014. How's it going today, Jordan? It's going great. How are you? Doing all right. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you for joining me. You know, I've been actually following Grounds and Hounds for a while uh, from the periphery because, you know, I'm a dog lover and and my wife actually works for a dog shelter. She works at the Humane Society. And uh, so and we're just dog people, you know, so we've seen it on the shelf. We get excited about it. So it's really cool to uh, to meet you and being the, the person behind this brand. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And uh, that's awesome to hear. I love hearing that you guys have the uh, the rescue in the house and, and you're involved. And that's always, you know, top priority for us. Awesome. So what exactly, I mean, let's, let's set it up here for a second. So you were at the time you were living in Los Angeles, is that correct? Or when did you start the company? It was in 2014. Yes. So kind of roundabout um, <clears throat> going way back. So my, my, Personal background is in the beverage industry. Um, I grew up around wine and spirits mainly, and and I moved out originally to Sonoma after undergrad and was working in the wine industry. And when I moved to Los Angeles, same industry um, was you know really tied into that world in the the beverage space. And then I adopted my dog Molly, who's uh, kind of the feature dog and, and the icon of our brand. Um, I adopted her in 2012 in Santa Monica. And she was what became the catalyst for Grounds and Hounds. And that was in Los Angeles. So, you know, the origin story for G&H started with um, Molly in 2012 coming into my life. And then, you know, really starting to think about more of a problem solving approach in the animal rescue world, which iterated itself into what became Grounds and Hounds Coffee Co. So you were just so concerned about... You know, like Molly touched your heart and you were just so sort of touched by the idea of dogs being given up and, you know, and kill shelters and those types of things. And and that's really what inspired you to do this. And why did you pick coffee? Yeah. So two two reasons. One, um, I, I really love coffee. I grew up in Pittsburgh, um, cold, dark mornings. And since I was 12 years old, there would be coffee pots on the countertop and you just take a cup and go. So I've always loved I've always loved coffee growing up. And then obviously being in the wine industry, very similar parallels between coffee when it comes from an agricultural product that has unique flavors from terroir and the processing, which develops, you know, really unique profiles. So coffee was almost a bit of a hobby for me while I was in the wine world. Um, and the other piece of it was really, you know, market opportunity and what I aspired to do with the brand. And so what I thought of early on was, you know, one, I would love to do something that has a scalability to it. Um, and it connects at an emotional level with with people consuming the product. Um, and if I made a great enough product that it could scale and create ever increasing opportunities to fund the the mission or the problem that I was trying to solve. Um, and so I looked at a few different spaces. I looked at capital costs of starting up different companies. Um, and then I looked at coffee really in depth. And this is 2012. And, 
you know, very similar to what we saw in the wine world was you know, a lot of kind of, you know, aficionado brands, the third wave coffees that were very, very hyper focused on appellation, on the processing, the, you know, the profile. Um, but there wasn't a lot in the emotional connection space on the shelf at that time. And so if you look at the wine world, you'd say, hey, that was like, you know, your Russian River Pinot Noir versus someone saying, hey, we were launching Menage a Trois Yellowtail, which blow up and sell 10 million cases. Um, my view was very similar in that if you made a great product and coffee kind of needed this at the time was if you made a great product that connected with people beyond just, you know, the specificity of being you know, an Ethiopian micro lot, um, that you could open the door to a lot of people who had previously been buying Starbucks and they were maybe Folgers getting a Maxwell house trade ups way up. Um, and that was the, the theory behind it was if we introduced this product more of the mass appeal approach, but delivered third wave quality that we had opened the door for a lot of opportunity. And, and coffee just seemed to have that open door for me at that time. Um, and this is a little bit early on in the e-com days. And I was not an e-com person necessarily. I wasn't saying like, hey, this is going to be a direct to consumer brand. Um, I was thinking Whole Foods, cafes, you know, the similar stuff. But we were perfectly positioned as well at that time to really tap into social media, tap into the rescue networks and bring the product outward beyond just being, you know, your um, local coffee roaster type of opportunity. You went to school, you said, in, in Miami area. What, what did you study in school? <clears throat> so undergrad, I went to FIU, um, played baseball down there those years. Blew my elbow out twice. So mainly if you said what I, I was studying, you know, how to be a professional athlete for, <laughs> for a while there. And then after the injuries occurred, I was international business uh, major undergrad and, and which was, you know, good program, really, you know, good opportunity to learn a lot about import export. Um, very hyper focused at the time in South America and Latin America, coincidentally, uh, just based off of the the focus of that program. So I was very familiar with, you know, the coincidentally, the coffee growing regions of of the Southern Hemisphere to start my career. Um, and then realistically, when I launched Grounds and Hounds, I was going back for my MBA, which also kind of dictated the structure of the business. Um, so I was going back to Notre Dame and I launched the company my first year at school um, out of my spare bedroom. So a lot of what has allowed us to become scalable and what has worked in the environment of direct to consumer was more or less default of me saying, like, I have to go like sit through an economics class and I can't necessarily be roasting and packing bags of coffee out of my garage. And so we created a little bit of an early stage, you know, 3PL model um, that, that would work autonomously as we grew. So that lent itself to becoming a direct consumer brand. But um, yeah, the early days of, of kind of like school is somehow always tied right back into where I've landed as an adult in my career. Amazing. Was that kind of like your your senior thesis was was creating this company? It was funny. So it was it was a really one of those happen chance things where I wanted to do the, the the company. I was very excited when I left to go back to grad school and I had just filed the LLC for Grounds and Hounds LLC. Still loose idea of what it would be. It would be, you know, about how do you fund animal rescue? How do you address two point one million dollars being euthanized? Can you make a profitable social impact business? But then you go to school, right? And grad school is unique. And I didn't know this. When you get there, the main focus early on is getting an internship. Like that's what they they really like. Hey, first year, it's all about getting an internship. And you get that internship, then you'll get your job offer after year two. And you know, you're on your way. So I put grounds and hounds to the back burner early on. But fortunately for me, I went to um, a marketing conference the second week of school and left with a few internship job offers. And with that, I suddenly had that whole block of the first half of the year where I wasn't interviewing. I wasn't doing like the prep work. And so I just said, hey, what the hell? Let's go all in and see what we can do um, with no money and, and see if we can't make this thing come to life in the next six months. Um, with that, there was coincidentally a professor at the school, um, Chris Stevens, who was one of the early founders of Curing Coffee. And so just another happen chance thing. I sit down, I say, hey, man, I got this idea. He starts helping kind of introduce me to a few people in the coffee space. Um, I'm cold calling roasters at this time saying like, hey, you know, do you guys want to do a 
a, co- a collab on this product and no one answers my calls. <laughs> um, eventually, you know, I find a really great partner um, uh, out of Minneapolis and we start, you know, working on the blend profiles. We start working on the concept. I'm selling furniture on eBay to pay for like packaging and, and first sample runs. Um, and then finally, in is it March of 2014 um, with six blends of coffee? So we had morning walk, paper and slippers, alpha blend. We did single origin Mexican Chiapas, single origin Ethiopian Yirgacheff, and a single origin Peruvian Swiss water decaf. One mug and one three quarter sleeve t shirt. We go live. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where I didn't know what to expect. But the first day, I think we had like $1,000 in sales. And I was like, oh my God, like, oh, we can't believe it. Look at this. Like, this, if I did this every day, I'm rich, you know, like, I, you don't really have a concept of scale at the time. But I was like, this is amazing. Um, and then, funny enough, like two days later, uh, of all the publications, Playboy writes like an article and we're included in, like, you know, oh, this is the coffee you want to have on your countertop to show that you care. Like, it was one of these, like, things I could never even share to our social media because we're <laughs> the opposite, we're kind of the opposite of that brand. So, I was like, oh, that's funny, but there's something here. Um, so I quit my internship in advance with Pepsi. I was like, hey guys, like, sorry, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna give this a shot. Um, and and then I just went all in that first year where you know we did you know 90,000 in sales the first year, all online. Um, and then we picked up some grocery stores, and and then from there it was just an iterative process of grinding it out and growing. Um, but yeah, it was one of those situations where like, you know, I didn't go into this as like, Hey, I have 30 years of experience in coffee and I want to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. It was much more of, I want to see if people would be interested in this. And if yes, can we make it interesting enough and scale it outward? And so that was really that first year was just a, a bit more of a, you know, minimum viable product approach of like, let's see what happens. And I did write like every, every school paper on it, which was helpful. <laughs> Anytime someone in their big, Oh, there's a growth strategy class. What are we going to do? I said, Hey, grounds and hounds, I'm going to do a project on ground. So with, with the project underway and the company underway, it did tie right back into a lot of the curriculum, but more so because the professors were kind of cool about, you know, letting me try things out. And they're like, Hey, you know what? It's at least you're going for it. You know, you can write your paper on this. We'll let you do it. Um, um, so it became a default kind of you know, like senior thesis, PhD type of project for me. That's the best way to do it. Anytime you're you're getting paid to complete your schoolwork, that's always that's a nice that's marriage it. of convenience there. Unfortunately, I was I was probably losing money in the <laughs> <laughs> I was spending I was spending my student loans on it. I was cutting back on, you know, meals so I could put that money back. But yeah, it was um it was definitely a, a, when people ask me about grad school, oh, is it worth it? I say it's worth it in the sense that it was a two year incubator where you don't have that pressure and stress of like, okay, well, I have to progress in my career. I have to get promotions. I got to do this for my boss. Um, it let me have that two year window of, I was just like, Hey, let's worst case scenario, leave here. And we, you know, don't have a business, but we had an experience. Um, and so I always recommend anyone that can carve out a block in their, their career to do something like that. It gives you unlimited flexibility to just take risk where in, in a normal day to day life, that's so difficult to ever really take that first step. That's amazing. And it seems like it's also one of those situations where kind of the the world was conspiring for your success. You know, I mean, you were you were building the blocks yourself by, you know, you get the business degree. So you have like kind of a level minded approach to things. You go in for the MBA. Uh, you already have knowledge and some experience in the beverage world. So that makes sense. So you're putting all these pieces into place, but then there's these external things happening too, like, like some really serendipitous meetings that you're, that are taking yeah. place and all these things come together to, to have a company with a successful launch while you're still in school, which is amazing. And, and how old were you at this point? Uh, Right before my 26th birthday. So I was 25, uh, nice. I was 20, 25 when we, I was like the week before. And so what's funny is I've actually shifted our anniversary. So my birthday is April 1st. We technically launched March 22nd, I believe. And I've just moved it. So now my the anniversary is April 1st for the company. It's yeah, easier. Link. I like to start Q2 <laughs> with a good, a good program. So I was like, you can have my birthday, but yeah, it was right before I turned 26. Um, the company went live and, and so, yeah, now it's been, 10 years geez we're coming up on 10 years of it um but it, yeah it's it was definitely fortuitous it was certainly an area where i i think my passion in life has always been beverages weirdly um and so i was predestined i think to end up doing something in this space like i had been reading wine spectator since i was like 10. like i my first high school my first college undergrad 
kind of speaking class presentation was on the distillation process for Jack Daniels whiskey and sour mash whiskey. And so like my background was like, I'm very passionate about beverages in general. Um, but yeah, when this, when this started to come together, you know, it's like anything, you don't know what you're doing, but you're very confident in those early days to do it. And so it was a lot of, you know, saying, Hey, I remember this from the wine industry. I knew this from the distribution world. Um, let's put that into play. And then just kind of riding that momentum and the excitement for those first two years. Yeah. And the twenties are exactly the right time to be taking big risks and, you know, kind of put it out there and see what works. And I'm, I'm with you as a beverage person, you know, it's like, I'm always one of those people that has like at least three drinks at, at my dinner table, <laughs> three or four drinks, you know, I need my water. I need my wine. I need this, you know, like it's always just a lot of glasses around. Um, and for me, you know, I was always into coffee and beer, uh, mm. was, was what I was really interested in. I like the process of it. I like the history. I like the whole thing. And, um, but when I decided on getting into coffee, it was basically sat down at the table with my girlfriend, then now wife. And she's like, well, what do you love? And I was like, I love beer and I love coffee. And, uh, you know, but I'm always a morning person, you know, so it's like, I like to wake up in the morning. So I'm probably not going to get into beer because I don't want to hang out of the bar all night. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, it's a different lifestyle. The, the, wine, the wine and liquor world. That's, that's a whole, that's a whole nother sleep schedule. Absolutely true. And a different crowd and yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> I wanted to circle back too, because I also think that it's interesting again, kind of all the factors that came into play here. And I think part of it also is, you know, I've noticed a lot of people with kind of athletic backgrounds uh, that that really serves them well, like that kind of, commitment, discipline, ambition, you know, rolls into the character of what you're doing. And so I, I, what, have you seen a specific way that that's kind of influenced your journey as well? Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> I think you have a natural inclination to be competitive um, if you grew up playing competitive sports. And so in the world of business, obviously, you know, there's the, the, you know, find, find what you love and do it and you will never work. And, and that's not, I genuinely don't believe in that because it's work every day. Right. And that's kind of what sports are. If you're trying to achieve and grow, you're challenging yourself daily to progress mm -hmm. advance. Um, and so while you are certainly competing externally, especially in the early days of the company, all you're really trying to do is incrementally improve. And I think a lot of people, um, would want the massive jumps. You know, you almost want the lottery ticket hockey stick growth from day one. Whereas if you have that probably more fitness or athletic focused background, you understand everything is just about, you know, making small gains 1% every day. And the compound interest of that over time will lead to big growth down the road. And so that was the, the kind of structure I had in place mentally where I knew what I knew. And I also knew I didn't know a lot. But that wasn't going to be the thing that stopped me. So I was willing to say, okay, well, you know, let's learn how to deal with, you know, cash flow management. Let's learn how to deal with vendor management. How are we going to work on, you know, grocery distribution placement? So they're all projects that you understand are going to be a challenge. You don't expect them to be easy or fun. And that's the same thing I would say, like, if you're getting ready for a new season, um, the off season shouldn't just be like, okay, we'll wait and see what happens. You go, okay, I need to practice and get better at this one specific thing until I've mastered it. Then I move to the next thing that's a challenge. And so that's the same structure I've always used kind of in the, the, you know, the mindset of how do you get a company to go from nothing to something? And then how do you get that to continue to grow? Um, it's the idea to constantly challenge yourself. I think that's such a great and healthy mindset to have as well. And I think, uh, especially as Americans, we all often have a hard time with that. You know, we want to, we want to grow quickly. We want to scale up, you know, all these, all these buzzwords, but really, uh, in the same reason why we give up on our new year's resolutions, you know, it's like, uh, I didn't get that bikini body in two weeks. So I'm going to yeah. you know forget the gym, but having that mindset of that incremental growth, that incremental improvement, I think that's, that's what gets you through it, you know, being in it for the marathon and not for the sprint. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, so I even to this day, my ever since I stopped playing baseball, um, I started, I took up endurance sports. And so now I do triathlons and th there's nothing fun about it. Right. Like, and I know <laughs> the fun is the completion and the improvement of it. And I think people expect like, you know, especially if you hear someone speak to classes, like I, I'll speak to Notre Dame classes at times. And a lot of people I remember would come in and be like, oh yeah, it's going to be exciting. And you do this and you can, it's your passion. 
But it's like, I think realistically, we should be telling people a mindset that's necessary to succeed is that you have to be willing to grind it out and understand that it is challenging more often than it's not. There are moments that are great, but more often it's, you know, it's that 10th mile of the run where it's just painful and you just have to figure out how do I keep going forward? Can I grind out more steps until it gets easier again? Um, and I think so many people are just waiting and they hit that first roadblock and they go, oh, this is hard. There's got to be something easier. I'm doing it wrong. And it's like, no, that's the, that is the process. Anyone that's done this has, you know, probably experienced it and they understand that it's not just like, you know, rainbows and puppy dogs. It's going to be challenging days and, you know, distributors aren't going to pay you and you're going to be scrambling to figure out how to keep the business afloat and you're not sleeping. But that's the challenge that you undertake from day one. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've always been a big proponent of you know trying to tell it like it is a little bit more when it comes to you know startups and and particularly what you see now. It's like, oh, I want to be a you know Bitcoin millionaire and and just go all in. And it, it, anything that's that easy is going to have some serious downside to it. And I think that's that's always part of the mentality is look for stuff that's challenging, um, and that's going to be what's rewarding and fulfilling for you more so than just easy and fun. Going back to school. And, and getting into it, what what exactly about coffee was interesting for you? Because it seems like you're very process oriented, like, uh, yeah. you know, your obsession with with whiskey and, you know, it's very process heavy uh, and, and even with the athletics. So what about coffee specifically was interesting for you? Yeah, I think from the product standpoint, uh, it's it's an extra, in my mind, it's a very rom romantic product uh, in terms of storytelling. And so you have a background in, in writing and storytelling. And, you know, so I can look at the origin story of a coffee and write a book, right? Like it makes it the whole, the whole thing is romantic to me from the seedlings to the picking, to the, you know, the processing, shipping, roasting, packaging to your door. There's such a unique story behind each one. Each region that grows coffee has its own unique story and origin story itself. So I always found that fascinating because it's almost like traveling mentally. You can sit down, like if I'm going to have a cup from Colombia or from Papua New Guinea, um, it's almost as if you're taking a little trip to each place and you can do some research. And that was always fascinating to me. Um, I just like, as I mentioned, I really like agricultural products. Uh, I find that really interesting uh, that, you know, we take something that's just grown in the wild and turn it into beer, right? It's, there's, the idea of that is just so interesting to me. And the fact that it influences the taste so heavily kind of always keeps you like, oh, I haven't tried everything. It's not Coca-Cola where it's a recipe and just pumping it out. It goes, well, if the weather was different this year in, you know, Panama, then the coffee is going to taste different this year. So you've never had the same coffee twice. And so that part was always interesting. Um, from a business standpoint, the you know, good and bad of it, and the reason why there are so many coffee companies is there are low barriers to entry. And mm -hmm. when you have no money, that's a great thing. So when, when you, you know, I'm like, I want to start, I can't start a whiskey distillery because that's going to cost me $3 million in capital. I'm going to have to age it for three years. I'm never going to have cash flow. And, and so from that standpoint, there's it's a very difficult path to take. You could say beer, microbreweries, things like that and go, okay, well, that's still going to take a ton of capital. It's going to take a long learning process. I have to come up with the recipes. Um, coffee is a little bit more straightforward in that there's only the step between you and the roasters, the, the actual coffee. And then the roasting process is obviously going to influence the end product. But you're not waiting for it to, to ferment. You're not waiting for it to, to be blended. You know, it, it's kind of a little bit more straightforward. So you can take an idea and put it into action faster. And so that was also part where I looked at a bunch of different industries. And I said, well, coffee, I could do this now. I could make this product. And we did. It went from idea, ideation to launch within 12 months. Um, and you know we were cash flow positive by month four, really, just from the e-com sales and the and the, the financing of the product. And so, like right off the bat, I was able to grow the business, and that was important to me. It was not just like, hey, we sold some bags, and I'll do another batch next month. It was how do we get this so we can scale it and continue to grow. So, coffee was very, um, you know, very profitable from that standpoint of not needing to be okay. It's aging in barrels for three years or I now I'm growing. So I have to go expand my warehouse and distribute my distillery by 16 stills. Like those are the bottlenecks that we were able to avoid. And so coffee from a kind of early stage product in my mind was like, I think this would scale. And I think we could make it big without all of those constraints I've seen, you know, particularly in the micro distillery space where I was pretty close with a lot of those guys back in the, the mid 2000s. 
you would see like, hey, they're great and they're really scaling, but they can't make more than X amount. And for them to do that, it's going to take two years until they really build out production to make more. And so from that that standpoint, you're just kind of under the constraint of this is our maximum output. Um, but with coffee, you can say, well, as long as we can obtain more of our green coffee that we're desiring, if we have some really good blends that are versatile um, and we have capacity with the roasting facilities and packaging and labor, there's no reason you can't go from one bag to one million bags um, with, with you know the same level of difficulty you'd have in other industries. So I just saw coffee as a great ro- roadmap to like for the mission, as I, I mentioned, was always front and center. How do you solve this problem of continuous and expanding funding for rescue organizations? And this was one that didn't cap out as fast as some of the other products I explored. That low barrier to entry you describe really is uh, kind of a modern thing as well, because it used to be a higher, much higher yep. barrier to entry because just having to get all the roasting equipment and things like this. And there really weren't many people doing white label and allowing the freedom to be, you know, more of like a sales and marketing company that had this product that was being produced. So it's it's really something that's come up in like the last 20 years that's, that's yep. given a lot of freedom. Um, are you still working with a third party roaster at this point? Yeah. So we've actually never, we've continued with the exact same one we started with, which has been great. So it's, I've, I've always followed more of that Patagonia model that mm-hmm. it's third party, but it's not, it's third party, but it's our only roaster. It's who we've worked with now for 10 years, went from, you know, one bag to 1 million bags. And so we were probably in the you know top tier of output from the facility and so it becomes more like your roaster and and you know we're so close with them that it's it's tied into our business um and it's at the heart of our product so we've continued to work with them forever and it's been great since it's you know allowed us to again continue to scale the products the offerings the business without having to hit that shell that the kind of ceiling of oh now we've maxed out we have to buy a facility we have to buy another roaster um, and so it's been a really great partnership for us for 10 years. And, you know, I've loved being able to kind of grow with them from early days of what they were doing and even being able to push it a bit to make it kind of start to hit some of our new product standards, our new product ideas. Um, but it's been a really fantastic relationship for us since day one, which I think is very, very rare for that to happen. Yeah, no, it's excellent. Yeah, exactly. That you had found somebody from the beginning and you still jive with them and, and are happy to be working with them. That is a bit rare. So you, when you started out the business specifically, it's a, a web-based business, direct to consumer, and then you got into grocery as well. You're selling on the grocery shelves. Um, are those still like the two primary channels, or are you expanding yeah. into wholesale or any other avenues? Um, so we do some cafe business, cafe, restaurant, retail, um, five pound bulk bags. We do some. It's not a core part. It's not a you know core part of our strategy or business, but we do some of that. E-commerce is still. 92 percent of the the revenue um wholesale at one point was 15 percent it went down to five percent coming out of covid not necessarily because we lost wholesale but because we grew e-commerce so significantly during that period of time um and then it's begun we just picked up sprouts and so with some bigger distribution hits in the last 12 months it's shifted itself back down towards you know eight percent of total revenue um with a goal i'd like to see us get closer to 15 percent over the next 12 to 18 months um but yeah the two main channels for us are e-com you know subscriptions e-com a la carte and then wholesale um with mainly grocery we do REI, um, some specialty stores like that. We have unique products in some of those locations and you know, different types of pet chains. What might carry something specific for the holidays, but um, most of our business is still very much coming out of e-com and then the traditional grocery space. That's cool. So you get some of the like the is that where the camp out blend came from? And well, that off trail is in there. Off trail is our steeping bag coffee. And then we we actually do quite a bit of um, kind of non coffee as well with REI. So we do uh, our chocolate dip, dark chocolate dipped espresso beans, which are popular for, you know, grab and go on a, a hike or trail. Um, we have espresso infused caramels. Now we do some hot chocolates and, and some of those products in there as well. So allowed us to kind of extend the line a bit more because their bagged coffee is not tremendous. It's just not a high demand product at REI. You want more functionality or things that you know tie back into that lifestyle. And fortunately for us, we're able to kind of meet that with some of our products on the site. 
Nice. When you talk about non-coffee and REI in the same sentence, I'm always brought back to this. There's a, you know, cause I travel a lot and, and sometimes I go to places where there's just not going to be cafes around, you know, you're in the mountains, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but I need the caffeine. I am addicted. Okay. That's real. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and it, you know, one time they have these like little packets, they're like the size of like a ketchup packet and, and it has like a, almost like a paste that is a caffeinated paste. Interesting. And, and it's basically supposed to supplement coffee, you know, so, and they're terrible. It's like absolutely <laughs> it's awful disgusting. Pace, oh my God. It's so, so bitter and awful. You just want to gag, but I'm just like, I'm addicted. I need this. <laughs> need it. So, just doing packets up in the mountains, trying oh, to get my man. caffeine fixed. <laughs> uh, yeah, because caffeine, I mean, as you know, obviously is the bitter taste, you know, when you yeah. don't like coffee, it's, it's the bitter taste in, in, ca- in coffee. And so I think a paste of it, I couldn't imagine how much yeah. additional coverage you'd need on that to make it taste palatable. It's not pleasant, but you know, that might be, that might be a market, another product iteration you could go into. Might be. I'm always, I, I love it. So like, I love our whole thing is always like, can we make products that are, are still core to the brand, but also allow new people into our ecosystem of what we do as a company. And so I've probably, even as a person who's personally very, um, you know, very particular about my coffee, I'm more open-minded to products because of the idea that the core mission for me is not to be, you know, the number one most uh, gold medal coffee brand in America. It's not my, it's just not what we do. It's not our thing. Our thing is more about if you love what we do from a mission standpoint, do we have something that allows you to take part in that mission with us? And so, yeah, we do, we do hot chocolates and we sell a lot. We do, you know, we do these caramel and confections and we sell a lot of those and we do cold brews and we do bagged, we do some flavored. So it's always been a lot more about finding the customer demand and what they want and making the brand for them more so than me just sitting down saying like, Oh yeah, I want to have like the most expensive small batch roast coffee that you ever had. And like, I, I would love to do that personally, but from a brand mission standpoint, it doesn't necessarily sync up. So we've been open to things that wouldn't fall into that normal, like coffee space. You know, we're, we're always pushing the envelope on what you can make and and offer as a coffee company. I think that's great. And it offers you a lot of freedom as well and, and freedom to, you know, expand your line and all those things. But also I, I just do find myself getting so tired of every single coffee company saying like, we source only the best beans in the world. And yeah. it's like, well, it's only one person that can actually say that, but yeah, you probably don't, you know, like <laughs> I'm sure your coffee's great, but it's, a, it's, you, you're making bold claims. You know, part of me wants to just say, we have the most decent coffee. <laughs> this coffee's You're okay. not going to be disappointed that often. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. You will have a good breakfast. <laughs> so that's all <laughs> I can say. And I think that was, that's the underlying theme for ground. Like for when I made Grounds and Hounds, a big factor of it for me was that like, how many people do you know that are truly coffee aficionados? It's yeah. mostly people that just like coffee. And they don't want to think about it. They just want to say, I like this coffee. I wake up. I love waking up and it's a good cup of coffee. Yeah, That's the core theme with 99% of coffee drinkers. And some of us would sit down and say, I want to measure it out specifically on my the, the grams of coffee I'm grinding. And then I'm going to time it on my coffee, my scale while I'm brewing and you know, particular amounts of water to coffee ratio. That's great. But that's not where the business is. The business is someone that just says, I want, you know, a really good dark roast. And when we launched, people weren't really making dark roasts. It was like it was anti dark roast in that time. And I said, I'll make the best dark roast you can find then. Like that was my goal. And so we've been selling more dark roasts than probably most companies in the country because we've always just said, like, yeah, I don't mind making a good dark roast. You know, why not? If you like it and you want to make a good cup, we're going to offer it to you. But I'm not going to sit there and be like, yeah, it's the, the finest, the finest green coffee that you could possibly find in its dark. It's really good green coffee. It's a super high quality specialty grade coffee. But the key is that you're having an amazing experience. And that's my goal. It's more of that you know, hospitality mindset is like, do you enjoy this? Do you want to buy it again? And that's the objective of a company to succeed. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, there's there's always a case to be made for the avant-garde. And like, that's that's what's going to push us. And, you know, we're going to challenge you with having these excellent and, you know, sort of uh, fruit forward coffees and this kind of thing. But at the same time, it's not the majority. That's always, that's going to be the outlier and, and kind of at the, the tip of the spear, as they say. Um, what do you enjoy? So what is it that you like in your cup of coffee in the morning? 
I'm all over, really. I think if you're, you know, it's like if you're a wine drinker or you're a coffee drinker and you're passionate about it, um, you're going to explore. You want to, you want to find. So it's like, you know, it's like the same in coffee. And the reason why there are the needs, for, like, and I love the specialty micro lot, you know, roasters because I do want to explore those things where I would want to try. You know, I love, I love African coffees, um, probably like most um, coffee guys. Like, I love uh, Ethiopian coffee is still at the top of my list. We've got, I've just had some really great coffee from Malawi. We've got a Congo coffee that's really nice. Kenya has. You know, been doing some amazing work. So, in the summer and warmer months, uh, a pour over from Kenya or from Africa is impossible to beat in my mind. But yeah, like you know, once the colder weather rolls in, I don't mind a you know a really hearty dark roast. You know, a good a good rich savory dark roast, the you know, float a nail type of coffee cup. Like that's right up my alley. Depending on the weather, um, cold brew. I mean, like I have. My cold brew here, our sunny spot blend, um, which is is all organic Mexican chiapas, dark roast, had a really nice natural sweetness to it, um, super smooth, you know, toddy cold brew in the summer months, can't go wrong there. So I'm kind of all over and it. It, it really is just about that exploration piece. I weirdly like I'm a guy that'll try everybody's decaf, like not because my decaf, <laughs> but I'm like, I want to see who can actually make like a really great decaf just out of curiosity. And so I'll try everything. Um and so my palates become pretty wide ranging when it comes to that, where, you know, if you're in the house, I have nine different coffees in the cupboard and they're nine different, completely different styles where just is like, Hey, or here's a you know five blend roast of light roast for, you know, heavily featuring Ethiopian. And then here's a super dark roast, um, Sumatran. We just launched this blend called the beast, which is, um, really dark, like super dark French roast, Sumatra, Nicaragua, Guatemala. And I mean, it's like as strong as you can make a cup of coffee. And I love it at times. And then other times I'm like, man, I just want to have the lightest cup of pour over you can possibly have right now. It's true. You drink with your moods and, and with the seasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And for decaf, you know, I mean, decaf has improved recently because mm -hmm. there was a bigger demand for decaf all of a sudden. You know, I think through yeah. the through the pandemic and, and people having their nerves fried for a little bit, <laughs> uh, suddenly decaf and like half calf brews uh, started coming out. And so we see a little bit better coffees in there because ultimately uh, there's only a certain amount of decaf that's happening, you know, so, right. so Swiss water is kind of the big decaffeinating processing plant um, in Canada and that's in North America. Uh, yeah. There's one in Mexico that's the mountain water process. And then, you know, and they normally are the ones deciding what coffee gets decaffeinated or the importers are sending over coffees that they're going to have decaffeinated so they can hold them in their holdings. But most roasters just have to pick from what's there. Yeah. So if you if you truly want like great decaf, then you have to take great coffee and send it to get decaffeinated. <laughs> yeah, which people are typically not willing to pay for, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. But I think again, the market showing that there's a, a bigger need and, and more people interested in quality decaf, I think is leading to some to to send higher quality coffees there. And then yeah. you get higher quality coffees out. And I think that it's a great, it's a great kind of thought for generally how products should be developed right it's more of you have two approaches one you can either create the market by pushing the boundaries so far and opening the door for people and that goes back to like you know, the art the cold brew days like it was iced coffee and being cold and people realize they want that alternatively you look at you know the reason a lot of people might not drink decaf is because it's not typically very good and right. i drink i'll drink coffee 24 hours a day um you know and, and I'll, I like decaf in the evenings if I'm not having a glass of wine or whiskey and I'm yeah. just trying to work or sit, you know, a decaf's great, but it's just been difficult. So we have a dark roast decaf that's fantastic. Um, and we do a Swiss water, single origin Peruvian decaf, which is really nice. And now we're coming out with a, um, a vanilla flavor decaf. We have a, because the market's been saying like, we want more decaf options than we can find. And so it definitely starts to say, well, let's invest a little bit heavier in these areas that show traction instead of just continuing to pile into the same spaces everyone's already saturated to death. Yeah, I was the same way. I got into decaf when I was a barista. I was working in the cafes. And because I just loved, it was so tasty, you know, espresso yeah. was so tasty. I kept drinking too many. So I started getting the twitch, started getting the little caffeine twitch. The, eye, the eye. eyes up and down a little. Literally. So, so I was like, I was like, you know what? I still want like three lattes in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to make it with decaf. 
And uh, so that was the the beginning of my exploration with decaf. Was really, I, I, really I need your tips. On, I need your like list of the best decaps I've ever had. It'll be a weird niche show from this that no one. <laughs> Six yeah. of us like to watch, but go, oh, what's the best decaf you found this week? Just nerd out on decaf for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's really interesting. And one of the other things that I, I liked about your site, and, and I think it's important because you are a web-based business, is uh, the merch, you know, like you got, I get, that has to be a big part of the business because you guys have cool merch, you know, you got the apparel, you got cool mugs, uh, all this fun stuff. How much of the, of the business does come down to merch versus coffee? Yeah, we're probably, it's, it's decreased a bit coming out of COVID. There was a period where it was, it was more significant, but it's probably about 25% of the revenue from the site is coming okay. from non-coffee, which is really strong. Um, and in terms of how much that would be dollar volume wise, it's bigger than like, you know, t-shirt companies. It's funny. I, I looked up, I go, Oh wow. I'm like running a shirt company now. I, I didn't realize <laughs> it. it was just one of those things. We never was what I expected to do, but there's a, yeah, there's a very definite purpose behind all of those products. Um, it's not just like, Hey, I think we should like offer a tote bag or we should offer, we have, you know, in the dog world in particular, if you're a dog parent, you know, you're a dog and coffee guy, but someone might be a dog and running guy. Someone might be a dog and hiking guy. And so the dog is always the plus on top of what your core lifestyle need is or attribute is. And so what we want to do is find things that again, tie back to what you're passionate about. And we're passionate about everything on the site. Like I'm taking the dogs hiking in Sedona in a week. And like, that's what I do for fun. And then we're active with sports. We love coffee. Um, you know, we have pit bulls. And so we have a pit bull collection and there, that's all part of authenticity of the brand. But in our space, it's about finding you know, ways to introduce you to the brand. That's not just coffee because Again, if you're not necessarily comfortable buying coffee that's fifteen dollars, or you're not comfortable in the space, we would rather introduce you than saying like, "Well, I want the dogs and coffee tea because I do love that." And then you're there, and you go, "Well, I might as well try the sampler pack." Um, so it's a great way to introduce the brand to new people. And then obviously, when they they have the shirt or mug and they're out and about, that opens the opportunity for introducing new people to the brand via conversation and a little bit more of that out of home effect. So. Um, it's a yeah, it's a core piece of how do you scale an e-com brand, I think, is having that ability to say it's not just I come in and buy a bag of coffee one at a time. You say, I want you to buy a bag and a mug, and then I want you to share a, you know, share a hat with a friend. And so it opens it up to be a lot more of that lifestyle approach versus just your core, like I only have six blends of coffee on the site. And then it also expands into people who like maybe the parents are buying the coffee, but then the kids are into the merch yeah. now or whatever it is. And, and so there's point. something for the whole family. Something I think is interesting and, and you brought it up, which is lifestyle brand, you know, and that's what it's always been called. But I think more recently we're seeing a lot of brands uh, specifically in the coffee space that are more identity brands, yeah. you know, and it's more about like, how do people identify themselves and then how do they find that identity and the products that they're purchasing? And I think it's beyond lifestyle and it really is coming down to core values and yeah, yeah. You know, what, what people really believe in. And so again, you know, in many ways you were ahead of the game, you know, you were, you were very early on in the, the web-based business, but then also very early on in kind of this identity brand uh, business, which has been picking up a lot. And and have you noticed that yourself as well? And 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 how important has that been for you? Yeah, well, I think, um, and and this is beyond just coffee. This goes for CPG in general. Yeah. Uh, realistically, and I, I mean, I'm willing to say this as somebody in the space, we don't really need any more coffee brands. Right? Like we don't need in terms of needs, we want more and we want more options. We want more options of, you know, peanut butter and we want more, but we don't need more because there's already a peanut, right? It's there. And so, right. so that's what I notice. Even if you go to like Expo West or some of these trade shows, it's kind of how you create a brand now, because you can't come in and just say, we're going to have a better price than Procter and Gamble, or we're going to outmaneuver General Mills. So you, not going to work. So what you need to do, particularly in the world of social media, is find a way to align with your core audience. And what that typically means now is that you're going to have shared values. And that's how you're going to build up your beachhead market of like, okay, well, our core cluster. And honestly, I learned this from my days with Sailor Jerry rum back in uh, my wine and spirits days. One of our brands was Sailor Jerry. One was uh, Hendrix Gin. And they're both same portfolio, very different brands, very different uh, voice, but they had a distinct identity behind them. And Sailor Jerry was, you know, 
tattoos, Americana, um, rockabilly. And then Hendrix was a little bit more of like bartender, a little upscale curiosity, uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn type of hipster approach. And they they owned those and they were very they were very specific about focusing in those spaces. And so that certainly played a part where I understood that you you needed to have a really strong identity as a brand and a company to succeed in a space that's relatively saturated and it's already kind of fragmented. You need to be able to bring together people around a specific reason. And yeah, for us, um, we're probably the most kind of non-political open of all of them. We're very much just like dogs can dogs bring people together. Coffee brings people together. If we're all here working on a solution for helping to save the lives of 2 million dogs, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. A lot of people come together for that purpose. And so for us, it's always been about having that broad net of, you know, focusing very heavily on our social media. It's all dogs. It's all coffee. That's what we do. Um, we're going to tell you stories about helping dogs. We're going to show you dogs being helped. We're going to give you tips on how, you know, you can help with your dog. We're going to help you with coffee, but it's about being very specific about that. Um, and I think people, you know, will either connect with it or they won't. So if you're like, I love cats and tea, I'm okay with that because there's probably a brand out there for you. But I want to know that if you love dog and coffee, you're going to land in here and you're going to be like, oh man, this was made for me. And I think that's what other brands are doing and they do well um, is you don't necessarily just make it for, you know, the marketplace. You don't go, I, I want to have a $14 coffee on the shelf and I'll figure it out. You say, I want to make, uh, you know, a coffee for Jordan. And what is Jordan like? And that's who this product is for. And that's a persona that probably carries across the border. And you're going to have, you know, hopefully a big enough market size to build a brand. But that's what the most successful brands have done. And then once you break through, you can get a little bit more mainstream. Um, but in my mind, it's like that is the new path to growing a brand is you have to be very, very focused on almost one specific thing until you scale. And then once you scale, you can start to, okay, let's expand outward. Let's add some additional markets on. But I think that's why you've seen so many new brands come out and they just kind of pick a thing. They go, okay, this is what we are. This is what we believe in. This is why we're here. Like it, don't like it, come on in. Um, and that's been really the successful path or at least the attempted path for the last, let's say four or five years on social media in particular to launch with those digitally native brands. I think it's really smart and you hit the nail right on the head. It's just, it's because, because before when it was lifestyle, it was always trying to be like a little bit more broad. And I think it's just getting more and more narrow and it's about one specific thing in addition to the product, of course, yeah. you know, so it's like you got fire department coffee, you care about fire departments and you yeah, want to have coffee, it. but you're going to do it there, you know, or yeah, yeah. black rifle it's, coffee, you know, like, so it's, it's so uh, getting more and more niche and more and more splintered, but it's a way that people really more and more, I think, because commerce and because we're such a commercial society, uh, that's how people are expressing themselves is, is where yeah. they're putting their dollars. And so it becomes really important to them. And I think, you know, it's like anything back when we were growing up, um, you had your sports teams, you yeah. had, let's say your churches or what your religions look. I mean, like, so everyone had their communities and I think the communities have become so dispersed beyond geographic regions that you do start to identify with things, right? Or you, you try to find brands, you try to find things that you could, you could kind of say, okay, they believe what I believe they represent what I represent. And you roll that together. And I think that for better or worse, right? Like, I'm not saying that's the, the objective for society long term is everyone just, you know, picks a brand. Um, but I think it's definitely become a place where people start to say, all right, well, I can go here. And this is somebody that does represent what I represent. And, you know, it's a great product. And I believe in what they do. So that's been the trend I've seen. But I think I think at some point it'll, it'll ebb and flow back a bit. You know, it'll have uh, ideally people, you know, social media has become less, it's I think going to become less fragmented um, mm. with some of these iOS changes. You're, you're seeing a lot more, I think, cross pollination than we did in the 2015 to 2020 range. And so I think that'll start to, um, you know, maybe open people up to seeing and introducing themselves to more products and brands that they otherwise five years ago, it just the algorithms wouldn't show it to you. You didn't know it existed, but in that space, they're really popular. Now I think you're seeing a little bit more of, you know, rounds and hounds might show up somewhere else that it never hit before. And so new people come to the brand that wouldn't have. And I hope that starts to open the doors for, you know, other companies as well. 
Yeah, that's interesting. You know, and it was like one of those things, uh, like you mentioned, like sports teams or, you know, if you went to the same college or from the same town, you know, Vonnegut referred to those as grand faloons, you know, yeah. which is kind of like your way of identifying, but it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, you're not actually connected in any real way, but people identify with that. And in some ways, uh, by making these choices based on shared values, it's maybe even more of a connection. I'm just riffing here, but yeah. you know, like maybe it's even more of a substantial connection than those grand faloons because you're making a choice and it's not just based on where you live, but it's based on what you actually believe and what you think about and what you care about. And yeah. so, and in a virtual society, you know, when we're living online, that's a safer way to find people that you can have a conversation with because oh. you, already, you already have this base note. I think I hear a, a hound in the background there. So I'd say it's jazz. That's my, uh, that was the, 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 most, the most recent pit bull rescue. She can be a nuisance. That's okay. You know, we need contributions. We can't have like a dog. <laughs> That's how you at least, again, we're authentic, right? Like I, <laughs> exactly. I'm not making it up with no dogs. There's usually a dog harassing me somehow all the time. But yeah, I think you're, you're, you're definitely right. Um, and that's that's something we you know we've seen continue to evolve and what we've always noticed is that you know people want one they want to have social impact more so now and the the issue really comes down to what do you believe is social impact mm -hmm. and that typically aligns with what your values are so if your brand is grounds and hounds and you care about benefiting and supporting animal rescue and that's a core pillar for you is like i'm an animal lover this is what i believe and i really want to you know make an impact and i can do it with a cup of coffee um then you can align with us and if yours is i want to support first responders and you know my my local firefighters then you can support that brand and so like there's i think there's certainly an element where people do want to feel that there's more to it than just a transaction um and we're all or i think everyone's always looking for for meaning in spaces and, and that's an area where ideally um sorry <laughs> uh, ideally we you know we can provide that for for them in a, in a sense but at the same time you know it's it's really just a, a way to say like if you feel good buying something that usually is what gets you to come back again and a lot of it is beyond just the product because there are satisfactory products in all categories but those products don't necessarily make you feel great when you buy them it's just a transaction but i want you to say like i, I love when people say you, i love your brand like th that's something that when you start it that's your objective is that you want them to feel that they're like i'm connected to this i love what you do this is my favorite brand that's that's transcending just being like you're my favorite coffee i'm now you know up here maybe above nike maybe above whoever like whatever your favorite restaurant is but if you're like i love what you do i love your stories i love your social media that's a connection that goes well beyond coffee and i think that should be the objective for all brands is that you want them you want people to love what you do as a whole versus just being like oh yeah i love your dark roast like that's nice but if you go, I love you as a company, then that's something that's hard to beat. It is true. It is true. Cause I'm, I'm the same as you. Like I'm i uh, I'm an explorer when it comes to coffee. I like to have different things at different times, my moods and, and yes, I've had, I've had your coffee. It's good. It's very good. Yep. And, but honestly, I love, I got like one of the camp out mugs and yep. uh, you know, it's got like, um, Canis major on it or no. Yeah, maybe that's true. Uh, one of the constellations on it and we put little details in there for people that pay attention. <laughs> and I love it. You know, I was like, I love this mug. <laughs> and that's, and that's, yeah, I think that's the, and then when you go, if you're a hiker or camper, um, it feels like it's made for you other than like, you know, Patagonia, I think is wrote the playbook for a lot of this. Um, yeah. and, and I very much respect what they've done as a brand and they're very authentic about a lot of what they do, but you know, it's, it's certainly trial and error figuring it out. And, um, what they've done though is obviously like you know if you're an outdoors person you have multiple choices you can buy a lot of products but you might migrate to patagonia one because you know them their products are recommended but i think now a lot of it is you you align with their philanthropic efforts or you really believe highly in what they're doing from a, a supply chain standpoint and i think that's who really laid it out there Ivan chauvenar was like this is kind of the the next wave of business and he's the person i hear most referred to when people are talking particularly younger people in entrepreneurship mm. i feel like that is somebody that's kind of laid out what the future could look like um when it comes to like what's the purpose not esg of like okay just you know some lip service that we're doing something but people that are saying like i want to solve a problem and I want to have a great product and be, you know, financially successful as a person. And if you could tie those together, he he kind of wrote that playbook. And I think a lot of us have started following it since then. 
Very cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. Now I have somebody to research and uh, read about. Oh yeah, it's a great book to read. Um, Let my people surf. Um, very. It's his kind of like it's his 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 biography, autobiography slash Patagonia's uh, kind of corporate philosophy. But does, does a really great job of laying out. You know, and again, I think all of us in, in the entrepreneurship world are good at retroactively telling our story. You know, a lot of days you're just doing it, and then you look back 15 years and you go, "Here's why I did that." Right? Like you can you can really piece those together. So there's a lot of it, but from a from an emotive standpoint, you'd say, yes, yeah, this, this is really great to see. And I think a lot of companies have been influenced by the idea that you can balance, you know, corporate initiatives, investor initiatives with your objectives to, you know, do better things for the world. Um, and for us, great coffee, helping dogs. Um, but doesn't mean everyone has to do that. It could just be what you're passionate about. If it's helping kids, families, you know, nature, environment, oceans, everything needs a little love. And that's something I think, you know, entrepreneurship should be focused on is beyond just, you know, how to make a little bit more money, but how to solve problems, which is kind of the root of the French word for entrepreneurship. So that's what I'd like to see a little bit more of. I like it. Take it to the next level. And you also just named like 10 different coffee companies we could start tomorrow, you know, <laughs> it's not, yeah. <laughs> save the ocean coffee. Right. And I think the um, one area I've always looked at, and I talk a lot about is that you, you still need to be a great company. And I mm -hmm. think that's something that people overlook because the opportunities are there. You could say, I want to make you, I could come out tomorrow and say, I have an idea for a coffee company that extracts ocean from ocean plastic. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do it, but if you don't execute your business, if you don't run the business, well, it doesn't matter. It's just an idea. Um, yep. I think that's where a lot of, a lot of really great ideas and good intentions get lost is that people don't understand it. Well, yes, I'm you know running grounds and hounds, and our philanthropic initiative is to help animal rescue. At the end of the day, I still need to be a great coffee company. I can't not compete. You can't have a worse cup of coffee with us than Intelligentsia. You can't have a worse experience than us with than with counterculture. I need to make sure that the product delivers and the experience is at that level or greater because you're expecting, like, oh, it helps dogs. It's probably you know a charity brand. I right. need to exceed it. So you go, Oh my God, that's the best coffee I've had. Or this is the, you know, this is the fastest shipping. And that's something we've always really strived for is that the missions, you know, at the core of what we do, but day to day want to be the best coffee company on the planet. And you need to authentically be passionate about your niche, you know, so you you can't just be a billionaire who's like, oh, I'm going to make 10 different companies about 10 different causes just because it's, it's doing well. You have to actually care about it and, and be part yeah. of that world, you know, because you're speaking directly to a, a specific community. So I think the fact that obviously you're passionate about it, you care about these animals and that comes through not just in the brand, but also in everything that you do. That's why it's working. Yeah, yeah, you you gotta you gotta roll up your sleeves. I think yeah. if you're not part of the community, one, you, you people see through it, but two, you don't you don't know what to say. Like, yeah, I'm I'm in the social media channels every day. I'm engaging with our our audience. I'm creating content and stories, but a lot of the ideas and things we we come out with are based off of you know firsthand experience of being a dog parent. Like we have a new blend coming out in the summer. I'm really excited about, but. You know, when people see it, it'll connect so heavily with people that let their dog sleep in their bed, right? Like mm -hmm. it's something like if you do this, you understand, but like you don't know that if you're just like going to a marketing agency and saying, hey, we need some, you know, coffee blends. Um, it ties back directly, you know, you you live it, you experience it, you get it. And that's something I think we want people to feel. And a great brand makes you feel when you walk, you go, oh, like, yeah, they they did this, they understand me. Like they know what I like or they they know what this lifestyle is about. And I think that's always what helps you succeed in these spaces is that you know, if you're in there, firsthand research is better than anything else on the planet. Absolutely. And I'm looking, I'm looking at your website right now and I'm seeing, you know, we got whole bean coffee, we got ground coffee, we have uh, a cold brew kit. Do you have like a ready to drink product or? No, no RTD yet. It's been an area on the radar for a long time. We We looked at it really heavily probably 2018 2019 mm -hmm. um the issue is that the space becomes so saturated and in, in particularly to succeed you would need to ha either have corporate you know the i think was it wandering bear is there maybe the name mm -hmm. um, they did the bigger like bulk That's sizes fine. yeah a lot a lot of corporate distribution ocs that was a big channel or you need to be on grocery store shelves or c store 
and Starbucks kind of owns these stores. Um, grocery store at that time was a lot of those stump town, the blue bottle. Um, yeah. and then you saw a lot of like the local guys started and then chameleon. And, and so the space to me, it looked like it was, you know, it was a harder place to break into and it was becoming more and more saturated and people's palates were changing. So I've always kind of held off on it. Um, but it's, it's always there in the background of like, you know, what's that, what is the product? Because it's not just black cold brew anymore. You need to have, you know, right. certain flavors at plant-based is there, you know, adaptogens in it. And so it's understanding and being one or two years ahead of the curve. So you can have that path. And so that's kind of, what's always kept me off that, that specific product is that it's like, I don't want to just do another cold brew. It need to be something that creates a reason to buy it outside of just like, Oh, it's grounds and hounds cold brew. That's nice. But right. I want to be, can we sell it to, you know, 15,000 stores or is it just a nice local product? And you have the K cups in here as well. Have you, have you considered doing uh, either instant coffee or are there any other specific like kind of product formats that you're looking at expanding into? Looked at instant. It's, it's an area. So we, you know, we've got this, the tea bag coffee, we've got K cups, we've got cold brew pouches, we have cold brew blends and the instant coffee is an area where I, you know, I have not been able to jump that hurdle yet personally of it's, it's a good product. I've had, I've sampled probably 200 different instant coffees to try to figure out what I like. And they're all good. Um, and some of them are better than others, but I can't figure out yet what the market is for it, for us. Um, mm. And is it big enough to, you know, take on the materials, the launch plan. And so I haven't dabbled in instant coffee yet. Um, you know, RTD is always on there. I have explored different areas like tea, uh, you know, different non-coffee items that you could add into the consumable space. Um, but really, you know, we've had a ton of success since we started our flavor program. And so kind of doing more unique uh, outlier flavors has become a, a really fun and interesting space for us. Um, you know, we launched chocolate peanut butter last fall, and that's been a rock star. Uh, we do LTOs and like limited time products. So we did shamrock blend. Um, around St. Patty's Day, which just blew it out of the water, red velvet cupcake, and you know, in a Valentine's Day window, we have coconut mocha, cocoa mocha coming out next month. Ooh, birthday blend. Birthday blend was for our anniversary this year, and and so that's that's become an area that was a brand new segment for us um, that I I didn't touch for years and years, and then I, I kind of went in with vanilla and hazelnut, kind of like you know basic stuff to start out. And it's just continued to grow. So within the coffee drinking space, there's still a lot of, I think, runway for us there. And then we just uh, we just launched the Beast, which you've seen on there. And so a lot of it's about upgrading and, and migrating packaging into new looks and formats. Um, but yeah, it's an area where you know, I'm interested in maybe some stuff that involves coffee. That's not necessarily just coffee. So it could be, you know, is it RTD coffee soda concepts? Are there things out there beyond just your, you know, here's a cup of, here's a cold brew and a you know, some oat milk and call it a day. Yeah. Not just go and head out straight, yeah. you know, straight into the world. Right. Well, cause yeah, I think again, like it's, it's knowing your competitive advantages or not, and we're still not a giant company. So it's not like I have a sales force and distribution in every store in America. And all I have to do is say, Hey, you know, take in two, two or three SKUs as part of our, our schematic, you know, we would have to make it worthwhile. And so I, I try to find like, where are the gaps in the market that we could really succeed in and and make a play for versus just going head into the biggest competition and saying like, you know, oh yeah, I bet you Starbucks won't really care. It's like, they'll, they'll notice, they'll notice and they'll, they'll make sure you're not on the shelf for them too long. Amazing. Jordan Karcher, CEO, founder of Grounds and Hounds. Thank you so much for your time today and, and for, you know, speaking so open and honestly, and it's really great to hear, you know, kind of your story, your entrepreneurial journey and where you've taken this company so far. Again, thank you so much for this, man. I appreciate it. It was great having you on. Likewise, it's been a blast. Thank you for having me. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcasts. A very special thanks to our guest, Jordan Karcher. Thanks, as always, for your support and listening. Please feel free to share this with a friend and get more people to listen. Always love to hear feedback and interesting ideas. If you have a guest that you think would be perfect for our show and you'd like to hear interviewed, please feel free to hit us up at info at fnbtherapy.com. Thanks and take care.